First of all, how many of you have had like at least one statistics course somewhere in your career? For how many of you is that the high point of your week? Nobody? Was that, for how many of you was that the high point of your week, the statistics course? No one. Okay. So uh, it's typical, by the way. I, I want to start out um, with something that everybody understands. I want to level set here, okay? So I'm going to start with something that everybody understands. <laughs> the differential equations of motion of a bicycle. You all understand these. The point is you don't solve them through the seat of your intellect. You solve them through the seat of your pants. There's a huge difference here. By the way, in my class at Stanford, anyone who can create a PowerPoint deck that will teach a non-bicycle rider to ride a bicycle gets an A+. You know, power corrupts. PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. And are there any pilots in the room? Anyone flown an airplane? OK. Yes, you've flown an airplane. Great. What? OK, great. So suppose you've read all the books on flying an airplane. You've never flown one. Read all the books, no flight instructor. You get in the airplane. You die, <laughs> OK? Suppose you've had flight instruction, but all they did was teach you how to control the plane, right? You know nothing about density, altitude, crosswinds. You live, but only for a week. I recommend flying just because it will teach you how to learn. Nothing. I, I flew gliders. It forces you to connect the seat of your intellect to the seat of your pants. And uh, you may have to do that with the subject I have tonight as well. There are going to be uh, interactive parts and there will be intellectual parts. At any rate, I have a name for connecting the seat of the intellect to the seat of the pants. I call it limbic analytics. Because the limbic system is that part of the brain that connects the reptilian brain to the rest of the stuff. And uh, you know, I was very lucky in the flaw of averages to have a cartoonist named Jeff Danziger do some of the drawings. And here's sort of a sensitive rendition of someone connecting the seat of their intellect to the seat of their pants. Now, I want to make one other comment about, about statistics. Uh, most people who've had a course on the subject end up with what I call post-traumatic statistics disorder, or PTSD. And th this is what we've got to become, we've got to get beyond. Uh, I'm going to start, oh, how many people, by the way, have heard of Jensen's inequality? Let's see, someone had heard of that earlier. Uh, right, well, two of you heard it from me earlier this evening. <laughs> My guess is that the only person who could actually describe it would be Lonnie over there. Um, and, and let me just say one other thing about my approach here. So first of all, it's going to be limbic. You haven't seen limbic analytics before, but you're about to. The other thing is that the sons of Catholics can tell Catholic jokes. The sons of Jews can tell Jewish jokes. I'm the son of a statistician. I can stick it to the statisticians. I have a certain certain poetic license. And in particular, the statisticians are why statistics wasn't your favorite course. So I kind of blame them for that. Um, I have this concept uh, that I'll be talking about tonight called red words and green words. A green word is something you can say in polite company. A red word is something you heard in a distant statistics course. For example, Jensen's inequality. And John Wiley, bless their hearts when they printed the book, printed all the red words in Dracula font. I thought that was a nice touch. Um, but, but Jensen's inequality, so you can tell people you learned some math here tonight, is the flaw of averages, or the strong form. Let me quickly demonstrate what the flaw of averages is. So let's suppose you're building out some kind of website there are 10 pages, the shopping cart page, the legal page, the about us page, whatever they are. And because you want to get this project done fast, you have 10 separate teams working in parallel. You get it? 
And all we have to do is get all 10 pages done and we go live. I want to point something out. On average, each team will take six weeks. But if anyone's developed a website or done, done any other software development, you know there's a lot of uncertainty in any software development. But the average is six weeks for each team. So the boss comes in and says, hey, when do we go live? And you say, I don't know, boss, because I don't know how long team one will take or team two. Or and the boss says, give me a number. That is the fork in the road to hell, by the way, right there. But what you might say is, would you settle for an average? What can the boss say? OK, it's the best you can do. Oh, but that's easy. Wait a minute. Each team is done in six weeks on average, so hey, on average, we ought to be done about six weeks. Maybe a little more, maybe a little less. Can't hold it to me. I mean, but come on, because there's uncertainty. But let's go with six weeks. OK, so I have kind of a quick question for the crowd here. And I want to use poll anywhere for this. But let me show you the problem first. What is the chance that we finish this project in six weeks? I'm not telling you very much. I'm telling you there are 10 tasks. Each task averages six weeks, but they're all uncertain. What's the chance? What's that? I have, I've said nothing about the variance. And we hear a one to, wait a minute. No, but I want to do a scientific study. So what I'm going to do here, no, no, I'm going to do this now, OK? Because I, 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 what I'm going to do is we're going to use uh, poll anywhere. Now, can you, you should be able to respond. Well, let's see, does it show? The, OK. Do you see how to respond? You can either do it on your phone or go to pollev.com slash savage. And, and this is, for my personal uh, edification here, because, uh, well, you'll see, we do not all have the same beliefs on this. So by the way, this is not an uncommon problem. And past stati statistics indicates that people are pretty uncertain about it. Now, is this telling me how fast people are coming in? This is actually more trouble than it's worth. But the reason I want to do it this way is that I don't want people following others, right? I, I want to find out what people really think. So usually by this point, uh, I would have seen some results. Let me, let me just, I'm going to show the results now. OK. Ah, OK. Very good. So the 1 in 100 and 1 in 1,000 are the big winners. Um, 1 in 1,000 is correct. And oh, we got, there we go. Oh, wait, things changed. Well, I'm supposed to lock this once I tell you that 1 in 1,000 is correct. Notice the people who kept going, even though, right, I always get cheaters. But let's go back to this. I'll tell you that, that in most, in most non-computer audiences, the big winner is 50%. OK? But it is, in fact, 1 in 1,000. Who could explain that to a 10-year-old? Yes. Why is it 1 in 1,000? Um, well, it's because uh, you said that each task takes six weeks, right? Each task takes six weeks on average. So you're saying that what is the chance of finishing What is the, the chance that the entire project finishes in yeah. six weeks or less? Let, let's, and by the way, do we, need, do we need the microphones for these people? OK. So I'm, I'm looking for an explanation uh, that a 10-year-old would understand that explains why this is roughly 1 in 1,000. What is the chance that none of them are winning? Well, that's, that's correct. That's correct. And why is that roughly 1 in 1,000? You might, might have to make a few little assumptions here. Yeah? Um, each one has 50% chance of success, therefore. OK, hold on a second. I didn't say each one had a 50% chance of success, but start there, for God's sakes. <laughs> right? I'm fine with that. 
Why? Because we're going to be able to explain it to a 10-year-old. It might not be that they are all 50-50, but if each one is a 50-50 chance of being greater or less than six Excuse weeks, a 10-year-old won't understand that. How do I explain? You don't know 10-year-olds around here. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. If it's an average, some of them have to be above and some of them This is not what I'm looking for. You're very close. I mean, you got, you got the math right. Okay. How many people have heard of OR, Operations Research? Anyone heard of that? That's where I started my career. And I ended up incredibly close. If you increment the first letter by just one, you get PR, Public Relations. Hence, Jensen's inequality becomes the flaw of averages. OK, one half to the 10th? No, no. For the 10-year-old, what's the chance of flipping 10 heads in a row? Good, OK, that took way too long. But now, you grasp the flaw of averages. And let me, uh, first of all, here's another cartoon from the book. You probably heard about the statistician who drowns in the river that's on average three feet deep. Uh, but there's another one that I kind of like a little better. Consider a drunk wandering back and forth on a busy highway. His average position is the center line. Therefore, the state of the drunk in his average position is alive, but on average, he's dead. That, does anyone know what a second order effect is? You heard of a second order effect? That's like the n squared term or the Taylor, no, this is not a second order effect. It's been known as Jensen's inequality for over 100 years. It's a public relations problem. It's everywhere, and so it needs a PR guy, and I am that guy. So in PR, you use everything you can use, I mean, including, I have an audio logo for it here. So here's the audio logo. You're all going to recognize this. Right, that was Intel. Okay, here's the flaw of averages audio logo. Okay, so I've convinced you maybe there's a problem. Uh, this is everywhere. The flaw of averages explains why everything is behind schedule, beyond budget, and below projection. Well, I've done something about it. So probabilitymanagement.org is a 501c3 nonprofit. And by the way, in this age of bombast, I do not want to be left behind. I have a new take on bombast, evidence-based bombast. It's way better than the other kind. What we have done is we have done for uncertainty what Arabic numerals did for numbers. Bombastic enough? Uh, well, part of the proof is we've had funding from all these big companies. And one of our co-founding board members uh, was Nobel laureate Harry Markowitz, who invented modern portfolio theory and a bunch of other wonderful stuff. So let me quickly show you what the Arabic numerals of uncertainty are. Um, the idea here is, well, maybe I should start with this. How many people have heard of Monte Carlo simulation? Great, and I love it. To use Monte Carlo simulation, what you do is you generate a bunch of random numbers that approximate some distribution. And no one seems to be using it much. By, oh, the people I'm talking about are the Excel users, the 1.2 billion of them. How many of the, them do you suppose are plugging averages into their models and thinking they're getting the average output out? Like all of them. Why aren't they using Monte Carlo? And I'll explain one important reason. Two important reasons. Oh, you had to buy Monte Carlo simulation software. That's no longer true. Two, how the heck would they know how to generate the right random variance? They wouldn't know. Let's address that problem first. Because when I realized that, I realized how wonderful it would be if we knew how to generate our own electricity, because then we could use light bulbs. And then I realized we were using light bulbs anyway. Now that really puzzled me, but I figured it out. There's a power grid out there, folks. It's wonderful. And you've got people who do know how to generate electricity, generating electricity in these big buildings. And then you've got this network with something called the 60-cycle AC current standard that delivers the electricity to these things. Probabilitymanagement.org has developed the 60-cycle AC current standard of probability distributions. And when I say we did it, I mean, no, we stole it, 
but we standardized it and democratized it. Okay, so let me first demonstrate the Arabic numerals of uncertainty. What I want to be able to do is to add uncertainties together and multiply them and do all those other things you do with numbers, only they're uncertain numbers. So I have something I call the arithmetic of uncertainty. I'm going to do it with dice. Anyone know what the, what the red word for the arithmetic of uncertainty is? Oh, I, I'm just interested. Does anyone know what the red word is for uncertain number? Here we go. Random. Uncertain number. What? Random variable. Very good. Random variable. But, but how many hands went up? I don't know. I, we should have gotten a count first. You spoiled my statistics by blurting it out. <laughs> OK, let me just remind you of red words, the definition, the acid test. It could not be uttered in a singles bar. OK, so what is the arithmetic of uncertainty? Look, wait a minute. You know what arithmetic is. Yeah, oh, but what if I'm uncertain about the numbers? Are you saying I can't do arithmetic? Of course I can. Here, we'll go do it with dice. First of all, the Arabic numeral of uncertainty is a vector of Monte Carlo trials. What's the big deal about that? Well, I can add them together. Let's test it out. So, oh, another thing is, my, my motto is that none of my successes have been planned and none of my plans have been successful. The only reason I'm here is that Microsoft fixed a bug in something called the data table that vectorizes Excel. I'd known about it for decades, but it just blew up Excel. So I've got these columns of numbers here. And in native Excel, by the way, here's an index statement. Uh, let me just point out, what we're doing is platform agnostic. Excel is just our first 1.2 billion users. But I mean, R, Python, you, it, this stuff can go anywhere. But here's an index statement pointing down into this array. Right? So the first row is a 4, 6, and a 5. The 9,765th row is three ones. How did I know that? It's just auditable data. Wait a minute. It's uncertainty as auditable data. There's a concept. Um, and now the nifty thing is that I can roll the dice using something called the data table in Excel. How many people have heard of it? Data, just to show you that it really exists. Data, what if analysis, data table. Who's heard of it? Who's heard of vectorization in programming? You vectorize something? That's what the data table does. Uh, you don't have to need to know how it works. But what's going to happen is, on this back sheet here, when I point to one of these dice, like I point to that thing, Excel is going to run the numbers 1 through 10,000 through that cell D2 there. OK? Get out your stopwatch. Let's see how long this takes. On your mark, get set, go. Wait a minute. That was limbically fast. That was something I can ride like a bicycle. Well, that's the, that's the uncertainty of one die from 1 to 6 with equal probability, right? Now let's do the arithmetic of uncertainty. Well, I add two dice. Now when I add two dice, and a lot of you know this, what's the smallest number I can get? A 2. What's the biggest number I can get? A 12. Do I get the, all the numbers from 2 to 12 with equal probability? Why not? It's a lot. But let's find out how lot. Boom, like that. Right, it goes up in the middle. There are more ways to get a 7. By the way, we were talking about the most amazing theorem in mathematics, the central limit theorem. Does anyone know what happens when I add a third die? The answer is, it starts getting bell-shaped. Also, by the way, every keystroke is 10,000 trials, right? Who's heard of, you, you all heard of simulation? Who's heard of unsimulation? 
Here, watch this. Control Z, minus 10,000 trials. How about this? How about multiplying two dice? Boom. OK, that's native Excel doing 10,000 Monte Carlo trials per keystroke, which means it's doing it at limbic speeds. Oh, and the arrays now, the arrays. So I'm a public relations guy, remember that. So at least I knew I had to start. I, have, I need to name these things something. You're all going to remember. You're never going to forget. And I knew I had to start with bit. Oh, no, 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 no. There are no zero. We didn't get any zeros. We just got, it turns out when you roll two, when you roll two integers, it's very hard to roll a prime number. There are no ways to get a 14 when you multiply two dice together. I don't know how you do that. A 14, that's, oh, a two times a seven. Oh, but we don't have a seven on the die. No, we're not going to get 14. No way to get 14 when you roll, when you multiply two dice together. That's 13. You don't get any 13s. Get 12. Get a bunch of 12s. Get a bunch of 6s. I, I haven't memorized this distribution. But because I can get it in a split second, I don't do any of this stuff anymore. I just use my calculator and calculate distributions. Right? OK. But let's get to the serious stuff, the public relations. What are we going to call this stuff? So obviously, I had to start with bit and byte. And Everybody know what a meme is? When, when you're designing, you're designing memes, it's like designing a drug. You want it to fit into a receptor. The beautiful thing about heroin is it fits right into your endorphin receptor, right? So I need something that fits into your bit and bite receptor. I knew right off the bat that I needed sip and slurp. Now, what would they stand for? That's the problem. I've learned from a friend at dictionary.com that when you run these things backwards like this, it's called a backronym. So SIP was pretty easy. Stochastic information packet. Slurp is tortured. Stochastic library unit with relationships preserved. But see, when you have uncertainties that are related to each other, like, I don't know, like, we, we pick someone off the street, and their height and their weight are both uncertain. Yeah, but they're related. Anyway, let's go back and apply this stuff now to our scheduling problem. So, oh, the first comment, guess what? I have a library of SIPs. How about that? Well, where would those come from? We'll get that uh, more into that in a minute, but let me give you one little clue about where they could come from. Uh, how about machine learning? What you're looking at here is actually a classification tree that we used um, at PG&E. I was, I was doing work on their gas pipeline, and obviously they're worried about the risk. But they're also worried about the cost. And so this classification tree is dividing various pipe repair jobs up into, into classes, and each class has its own unique distribution of cost per foot. So that's one nice place to get distributions is artificial intelligence and machine learning. So there's my little library. Now I go back to the project. Now the project, unfortunately, had a, a performance clause. That is to say, if we finish in, in more than seven weeks, we're penalized 100,000 per week. Uh, well, it's lucky we didn't say six weeks. So now, this is where the flaw of averages, or Jensen's inequality, comes into play. Oh, let me explain Jensen's inequality in, in math terms. If x is an uncertain number, and f of x is a function of x, then under what condition will f evaluated at the average of x equal the average of f? 
Do I need to say that again? I got a function of x. x is running around like this. I don't know what the hell it is. As it's doing that, the function is going up and down like this. Under what conditions, under what conditions will the average value of f be determined by plugging in the average value of x? A linear function. And who knows what linear means? And by the way, even if you know, I give you a five megabyte spreadsheet, is this linear? You can't tell. So when I say, re remember the flaw of averages states that plans based on average assumptions are wrong on average. And I mean, it, see, it's worse than just wrong sometimes. It's like, on average, you're wrong. I mean, that's horrible. Uh, I'll distinguish between the strong form and the weak form of the flaw of averages. You're looking at the strong form. The, the, the weak form is that when you hijack a 747 and ask for a billion dollars and have one chance in a thousand of getting away with it, the average take is a million dollars. That is the right average. It's a terrible characterization of a hijacking. But in places like Somalia, where you can actually syndicate piracy, it turns out to be a pretty good business model. Sure, I'll take a 1,000th share in 1,000 pirate jobs, and you just rake the money in. Okay, but that's the weak form. The strong form is worse than hijacking a 747, because you're not even right on average. I mean, from a mathematical perspective, I won't. Okay, all right. But this is what I want you to look at. If I plug in all the averages over here, I'm done in six weeks with no penalty. Oh, but look, I can cycle through my library. That can happen, or that can happen, or that can happen, or that can happen, or that can happen. By the way, this is a very important part of limbic analytics. All the stuff I'm discussing here is easy to explain. The hard part is getting anyone to understand this stuff, especially the boss. But look what, it, if, if I do this, and I say to the boss, you can't plug in average, because look, if that could happen, or that could happen, or that could, and you see, this one is always equal to the longest of those. How the heck is that going to be six weeks? Seriously, a little of that animation and people really catch on. Okay, but now look what I want. I don't want the app, I don't want, I don't want the outputs when I stick in the average inputs. I want the average of these. Oh, and guess what? There they are calculated by the data table right now. I've got those two arrays right there. Those are the output SIPs, right? So let's take a look. So let's take a look at what the average weeks to release is and the average penalty. You understand? That's what I want rather than the penalty of the average inputs. A small distinction, but a big difference. Oh, look at this. So if we plug in the averages, we're done in six weeks with no penalty. On average, it's 7.8 weeks with almost 87,000 in penalty. You look puzzled. You're not. You get, I mean, you know it has to be greater than six weeks, for God's sakes. Okay. So, yeah, question. Oh, hold on, hold on. We, uh, we need, yeah. Oh, well, so first of all, I used, I used very unrealistic distributions here because it's just a demo model. Right? Oh, well, I, I take you back to uh, machine learning. <laughs> exactly. OK, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that a little bit, a, a little bit later. But let's, um, let's now show how you would use such a model in practice. So we run back to the counterpart. We're getting killed. 86,000 in penalty. That's a disaster. So you run back to the counterpart and you say, oh, please, please, pretty please. How about a $50,000 penalty? Would you do that for us? And they say, sure, we'd be happy to do that at 6,000, if you're done in six days, right? And now our penalty is 92,000. Oh, no. Quick, undo, undo. And you go back to them and say, oh, would you, would you give us eight days? They say, sure, we'll give you eight days, but now the penalty is 150,000. Oh, we'll take it. Average of 23,000. 
Okay? I just want to know how you're solving these problems today. You might not be. But what level of stochastic enlightenment are you working at? Level zero. Boss, I don't know when it'll finish. Level minus one. That's dumb, by the way. Level zero is dumb. I don't know, boss. Level minus one. Dumber. Plug in the averages and say, oh, we'll finish then. Also known as accepted practice. Even accepted practice in, in our accounting standards. Smart. Simulate. Who has heard it said that a simulation is only as good as the data that goes into it? I'm about to disprove that. What's the last thing you do before you climb on a ladder to paint the side of your house? Shake. You shake it, do you? Oh, well, shaking a ladder is performing a Monte Carlo simulation of the ladder. You bombard it with random forces, and you see what the heck it does. I hate to clue you in, folks, but the distribution of forces when you shake a ladder is nothing like the distribution when you climb on it. And all I want to know is, Who's going to stop shaking ladders now that I've told you you've been using the wrong distribution your whole damn life? No, you're going to keep shaking ladders. With simulation, it's garbage in, insight out. I love simulation. OK, now let's, let's do one other example here. Well, first of all, let's talk about some real life examples. Uh, an important one, first of all, tell me where I am on time. Because I, I could go on for eight hours. Seriously, I, 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 I should be done by 8.30? OK, I got lots of time. So let me, let me do a real world example where uh, yeah, where, where I actually came up with a name of probability management. This involved. A problem at Royal Dutch Shell. Now, the other thing was, this was before the age of the data table. And so we had to do this by brute force. But here was Shell's problem. Shell was spending like a billion and a half bucks or something a year exploring for oil. And they had all these, they could simulate the daylights out of any oil exploration project. What they could not do was simulate their entire portfolio. Because how do you add probability distributions together? Well, it's very complicated. No, but not with SIPs. You have the SIPs, you just add the SIPs together. Does everybody understand that? If I take the, two di the, the, the SIPs, the two dice, I add the first two numbers together, I add the second two numbers together, I do it 10,000 times, there will be more sevens in there. Right? How many remember Marshall McLuhan, the guy who invented PR? The medium is the message. Anyone remember that? No. Well, for us, the medium is the Monte Carlo. The data is the simulation. And when you add those two together, you're just doing vector arithmetic. OK. So anyway, these folks had to choose uh, a portfolio. And uh, how many of you have heard of modern portfolio theory, efficient frontiers, risk return trade-offs? It's really what Harry Markowitz kind of invented in 1952. Uh, every dot here is a portfolio. This axis is the risk axis. That axis is the expected profit axis. And if I look down here at these averages at the bottom, I see that Ventures 4 and 4A have the highest averages. Right, maybe they're Nigeria. If I click on that, that's 1,000 Monte Carlo trials. And I discover there's like a 15% chance that this thing blows up politically but they have the highest average. So I could pick both of these. This is a little bit like hijacking the 747. I get the absolute maximum <laughs> you know, risk. And, and if I'm only picking two of them, I get a very high return for just picking two of them. Well, the underlying, now we have a slurp that drives all this, has got the SIPs of each of the ventures, but the venture SIPs are driven by things like world oil price, gas price in region one. Here's disruption in Nigeria. So Nigeria blows up on trial 11, and that runs over here. 
and equates to losing our shirt in Nigeria. But we discover that, so if I, if I invest in, in one Nigeria, I'm there. I could invest in Venture 6, more return, but no more risk. But Venture 5 turns out to be Norway. And Norway, if Nigeria blows up politically, Norway will dive in and fill that market somehow, in, you know, in our setup. This was, this was done for um, Shell execs at Cambridge University, uh, a, a class for them. So I click on, on Venture 5. Look, Venture 5 in, 5 out. 5 is a hedge, right? You see the risk go down and the return go up. But I can, oh, I should point out, the yellow dots are beyond budget. Now, now this is a nice way to sort of think of limbic analytics. Oh, you mean if I increased my budget, there'd be fewer yellow dots? Yes. Undo. That's our budget. And the blue line is the Pareto optimal or efficient frontier. And so I can click right there, click, and it says, oh, then you want this portfolio. Oh, that's too rich for your blood? Click down here. Now, what I want to point out is that the people, this is not the real model. The real model had 100 projects in it. The people using that model at Shell were two steps below the CEO. There was a CEO, director of exploration development, and then director of exploration. He was one of the people with his fingers on the mouse. That's important. If you want your work to be used, wouldn't you like it to be used by someone who's making decisions? But that's the beauty of at least an Excel dashboard. You know, you're not going to do all the underlying calculations in Excel, but at least if you have a dashboard, or, on, or, or in JavaScript on the web, that'll do. But do something that engages the de decision maker limbically. OK, let me uh, give you one other example here. Uh, so here's another common problem. All right. I think I can get rid of the dice. Oh, yes, I also have to show you. We have these, these models you're looking at. We have some free tools that let you build these. And when you build the model with a tool, you can share it with 1.2 billion of your closest friends because it's just using native Excel. It just builds it out of a native Excel, and you just ship it off. OK, typical problem. We're Best Buy. We've got some new tablet computer for the Christmas season. But they're like in Christmas colors, red and green. But after Christmas, you're going to have to throw these things away. But um, our best guess is demand is 100,000. We pay 30 bucks for them. We sell them for 40 bucks. Um, and well, of course, oh, everybody agrees that 100,000 is the best guess. You don't always have agreement on this, but let's suppose in this case, this is a, this is a project meeting, and everybody agrees that it's 100,000, but we're quite uncertain about the actual demand. So the boss says, What's profit going to be? And you say, I don't know. I don't know what demand's going to be. And the boss says, give me a number. And you say, would you settle for an average? Sure. You have to order these six months in advance. Don't forget that. You say, well, that's easy. We all agree that the average demand is 100,000. Yes, we agree on that. Fine, we'll order 100,000. And if we do, then our revenues are 4 million. Our costs, cost of goods sold is 3 million. And we make a million bucks. OK, is that our average profit? What do you think? Would I be talking about it if it were? Let's, let's be Bayesian about this. <laughs> the fact that I'm talking about it means it can't be the average. Explain to a 10-year-old why it can't be the average. Uh, OK, but I'll repeat it. Say again. So he says, if on even one trial it drops below 100,000, my average won't be a million. But why not? Suppose you have 10,000 stores. You distribute them all the different stores, and they're unable to go out into the inventory from one to the other. Some be will sell out, and some will sell out. Because I'm, 
I'm capped at a million. So a million is the maximum, not the average. It's the best case. How many people do this a day? God, if I got a tenth of a cent for every one, I would not be wasting my time here. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be booking my first, uh, they're going to have a, uh, an orbiting hotel, I hear, right? Probably a million dollars a night. I'd be going for that. OK, but now let's solve this problem. And I'm going to introduce you to the SIP math tools. And I'm going to do this in the sort of simplest possible dumb way. By the way, I'm using the beta tools, so these are likely to break. <laughs> I'm always testing them. OK, but I'm going to do this. I'm going to initialize this thing. I'm going to say, I have a library, a SIP library in an external workbook. OK. Where is that sucker? Oh, here it is. It's demand. All right. Let's just look at demand for a second. So demand, you're beginning to see now the open standard. Oh, it says, yeah, you have 1,000 trials in here. The provenance, yeah, I've signed. Remember, it's auditable data. You all know what Monte Carlo simulation is. How many of you know what an accountant is? Have you ever seen an accountant in the same room with Monte It's like oil and water. Those guys go nuts. Not with us. Oh, your accountants. Great. You saw that dice model? That's a deterministic model with 30,000 numbers in it. Why don't you start auditing those and come back when you're done? Get every one. Don't miss one. OK. So we've got metadata. In this library, we happen to have the average. It's stored in position 1,001. We have the 95th percentile. Oh, but where's the SIP? Oh, here's a little plus sign here. We've just hidden the actual SIP in the library. So it's in there, right? I mean, what do you learn from those? Well, unless you're an accountant. Yeah, then you want to look at each one of those. Exactly. OK, so I go back over here. By the way, like one keystroke so far? OK. Here comes the next keystroke. I'm going to go to my demand cell. I'm going to go to my library input, and I'm going to say, yeah, I want you to put demand in there. Because demand was the name of the SIP I pulled in. OK. Click. Overwrite the number? Sure, go ahead, overwrite. Boom. What's that? Oh my god, it's a distribution now. There's our friend the index statement. As in, as in, I can look at trial one, or trial two, or trial three, or trial four. By the way, I think trial nine is a doozy. Yeah, how about trial nine? You lose $325,000. Because, of course, what you probably told the boss was to expect a million dollars. Because he said, would an average do? You say, sure. So you plug in 100,000, and you say, well, it'll be a million. Um, by the way, we can also look at, because we've stored the average's metadata, so I'm just look at the average here. Click. Good. All right, now we have one more keystroke. One more keystroke. I want to know, so, oh, I go over to the, I go over to this table which was formed when I opened the library, because this is the jig on which we're going to be building the, the data table. I'll, I'll show you the mechanism of action of the data table, but, but this is just all happening automatically. Now I go back to the model, I put the cursor in that cell, and I say define that as an output. And I'm going to give it a name, profit. I click OK. And a 1,000 trials later, oh my goodness, there's a little distribution in that cell. And we now have a SIP of profit. So watch what I can do. It's named profit. Everything is just native Excel. So I can say, give me the average profit. Average of profit. So hold on a second. Let me format that right. OK. Uh, OK. So the profit of the average is a million. The average profit is 600,000. Not close enough for government work. Oh, let's, uh, use the microphone, please. So I'm missing. Yeah.
Yes. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You have to assume that the guy generating the electricity that comes out of your wall socket is going to run your vacuum cleaner. But it's not your department. It's, it's Adam Smith, separation of labor. You've got the producers of distributions and the consumers of distributions, and the industry that we're creating is distribution distribution. Okay. You, well, you still, you still want to know, wait, you still want to know how to generate them. Yeah. I got it. I got it. Let me just go back here again. By the way, we're going to talk, we will talk more about that. But, but, but let me start with this again. Actually, it's the third time I've shown this slide. So machine learning is great at this stuff because, and then we're going to fit distributions of this. I, 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 get, I get that you... Our, our frust no, no, you don't, it isn't you don't understand. It's that I don't want you to understand. I, I want to be... Good. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Okay. Think of it as early electronic, of early electricity. Right? And the first electricity... Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. When they were generating their own stuff, they got zapped. It wasn't until they separated the generators from the... Okay, now I want to show you another thing about this, by the way, because this is really... Oh, my favorite, my favorite button on the toolbar, by the way. So, uh, remember, I'm a public relations guy, and I am damn good at it. I probably know more operations research than any public relations guy on Earth. I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's not saying very much. It doesn't even mean I'm very good at PR. Just for a, for a guy who couldn't make it in OR and had to switch to PR. OK, but check this out. Well, probability distribution. How many syllables does that have? Oh, man, nine or something? Bad concept. It, it, it'll fire up your PTSD again. Here, what I'm sort of interested in, you know, what's the chance, for example, that my profit is greater than, let's say, 700,000. I might be interested in the chance it's greater than that. So my favorite button up here is the chance of whatever button. What's the chance that that is greater than that? And the answer is 62%. I knew that, but some of you might have to run a simulation to know something like that. Now watch this, no probability distributions, but I can tell you the chance that we're greater than zero, 84%, or 20,000, oh that's still too small, 200,000, 79%, no probability distributions, but I can tell you the chance that profit is greater than any number you put in. Oh, that, by the way, is the definition of a probability distribution. But don't tell anyone, or you will spoil the fun. Yes, another question. Le oh, let me tell you where it's coming from. Hold on a minute. Let's go back to the electric, the electric analogy here, all right? Electricity. There's a guy called the, uh, the public utility commissioner. You've heard of that? Got a lot of attention here in California. The, the parallel concept in probability management is the chief probability officer, the CPO. Chief probability officer. This is the guy who gets the blame. You pay him a lot of money, and you burn him if you get something wrong. And it's not simple. It's not simple at all, which is why the people doing the analysis should not be generating the distributions, because there's too much statistics involved, too much machine learning, too much data science. Against another? I don't understand okay, okay, I got. Okay, okay. I, I have one further analogy. Good. Let's see if it helps anyone else. So, if probability were beer, then the sip is the beer bottle. Okay. It's a way to distribute. Like so <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and when I tell people, 
Because I get exactly this question. Oh, well, how did you generate the distribution? It's a little bit like I've shown everybody the beer bottle, and they say, oh, and how, what kind of beer? How do you make the beer? I'm saying, you can put camel piss in a beer bottle. You just can't sell it as beer. I, the guy who makes the beer bottle, I don't care what you put in it. Okay? But I can't wait to get there because we've got guys working with us who have made strides in how to fit the distributions. And because there's so much inquiry, let me, let me move to that very quickly. I'm going to do just one more thing here, okay? And that is, and it's Bob, right? Is it? Sure. I have your card, but I, I, it's Bill. Start with a B. Yeah. And you, and you pointed out why we were hosed here, because it's like a maximum, you know, okay, exactly. Yeah. Lonnie said, you the decision maker, and I say, and you the data scientist is the guy who's building that library, right? So data science can build that thing for you. Yeah. So then you're building the simulation based on the data in the library. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, I could see that. Okay, good. Okay, so now, but watch this. I want to go back to the decision making. Okay, so look, we all agreed we got hosed here because that's the maximum, you bozos. Okay, well, wait a minute. Maybe we should have ordered more. Maybe 100,000 wasn't enough. I mean, look, what do I mean by should? I mean, let's maximize our average profit here. Our average profit is 600,000. That's not close enough for government work. If you thought it was going to be a million, for God's sakes. Okay, how many people think we should order more? It's easy to do, isn't it? Just change that number. Who wants to order more? Who wants to order less? Who wants to stand still where we are? Okay, okay, fine. Let's start with more. So we'll plug in 120,000, for example. And <laughs> our profit, look, here, limbic analytics. Undo, redo. <laughs> Bill, you still want to do that? No, you don't want to do that. Okay, limbic analytics. I want you to think Jurassic Park in the scene where Jeff Goldblum is waving the flashlight in front of the Tyrannosaurus. You remember that scene? Yeah. Undo, redo. Control Y, Control Z. Okay, now let's try ordering less. 80, one, one, two, three, 80,000. Ooh, 679,000. The right answer to this question is, you don't know, you shouldn't do it in your head. I myself wrote this problem for my textbook and I wrote it thinking you should order more. And when I ordered more and the simulation said I got a lower profit, I said, what's wrong with my simulation? I did not say, what's wrong with my head? <laughs> we never say that. <laughs> but now I know. <laughs> I don't try to do this stuff in my head anymore. OK, let's talk a little bit about where the distributions come from. This is so, so important. So, this is one place. Distributions come from forecasts. Who's done forecasting? Every forecast known to man produces a distribution. And let me show you how it works. All different ways, but they all arrive at a distribution. So in this case, I've got an upper and lower 95% confidence interval. I'm going in to model a normal distribution, and this is what happens. That is what happens to it. You've probably heard that around the office somewhere. And what happens next? All I'm saying is, stop flushing the goddamn distributions down the toilet. You've got them everywhere. And we have a way to bottle them up. OK, let me talk now a little more about bottling them up. And this. Um, so, the, uh, yeah, just a sec. I've got to say one more thing. If you think there's something deep here, you're on the wrong track. There's nothing new here. Was the smartphone new? It was not new. There were computers, there were touchscreens, and there were cell phones for decades. Then Steve Jobs comes along and says, 
Wow, what if we had a common communication protocol that meant that any smartphone could communicate with any other smartphone and with programs or whatever, and then, oh my God, then a smartphone becomes a node in a network of 100 million other smartphones. That's what was new. Were there vectors before me? Absolutely. Was there Monte Carlo? Absolutely. Were there even things that I would have called SIPs? Oh, absolutely. I stole them from stochastic optimization. Um, it's nothing new. It's just standardized. It's like the first railroads. You'd have a little two-foot two gauge, two gauge track going up into the forest. You've got the three-gauge track going to the coal mine. And Oh, make all the tracks the same size? Oh, that's ingenious. No. <laughs> it's, it's moronic not to, actually. OK, so this is not my work. This is a really bright guy that Lonnie and I both know named Tom Keelan, who's invented a new way to fit distributions. So just at a time when I want to get into the beer business, he's figured out how to brew this stuff. It's a really beautiful idea. How many people know what Taylor series are? It's like a polynomial that will fit any function. These things will fit virtually any distribution any known distribution, any continuous one, oh, any unknown continuous distribution, and, and they're computationally elegant. When you start fitting distributions, each one is its own hassle, and you've got, I, I don't want to go into it. You have to be an expert in one of these distributions. This thing is like almost one size fits all. So it can be unbounded or semi-bounded or bounded. You'll see what that means. Early on in this process, when, I, when he started showing me these things, which are called metalogs, I had an idea for solving an unsolved problem. And I suggested how we could do this. IID means identical independent distributions. And it turns out that there was no closed form for summing up identical log normal distributions. And I sort of showed him how to do this, thinking he never would. I thought I'd get rid of him, because my, my approach, I didn't see, <laughs> I didn't see how it would work, but I knew what direction to head in. And I feel a little bit like the guy who suggests that someone else climb half dome without ropes and pitons, and then after they do it, I want to take as much credit as I can. I am extremely proud that I'm getting my name on the paper, with Lonnie, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Well, Lonnie did some heavy lifting, too. But I pointed out half-domed, everybody. OK, but wait a minute. We, Tom's work is so elegant, and he did just such a beautiful job on this. And I started thinking, wow, if I can solve this, the first unsolved problem I ask of it, well, well, let's look at this. Could it fit a normal distribution? And again, it's like Taylor's series. Two, four, six, eight, ten terms. OK, look at this. How well does it fit? Their own mothers couldn't tell them apart. How about this one, a log normal, two, four, six, eight, ten terms. How about this? I don't even know what the heck this is for. But their own mothers couldn't tell them apart. How about this one? It's bounded at both ends. Fits perfectly. Well, it's hard to appreciate this, but this is a single family of formulas that fits every continuous distribution, basically. And Lonnie's implemented it already in, uh, uh, in Analytica, and we've implemented it in the SIPMath tools. Um, OK, it can also fit virtually any unknown distribution. So for example, I'm doing it time. Oh, yeah. For example, Tom is a fly fisherman. And you are looking at a steelhead trout a relative of the salmon, they are related, with a similar life progression. They're born upstream, they swim down to the ocean to feed, and they come back to spawn. The difference between steelhead and salmon is that sex kills salmon. It doesn't kill steelhead. And what that means is that when you look at the distribution of weights of steelhead, and here we're, Tom is fitting like up to a 10-term metal, it looks bimodal. And it looks bimodal because 
there's the, they're called the one salt fish and the two salt fish. Now, if someone showed this to me, in fact, when he showed it to me, my first inclination would be, well, yes, you can overfit a polynomial to anything. And so I'm going to prove to you in a second that this is not overfit. Because that, that, that would be, should be your first response. Oh, yeah. There really aren't two modes there. OK. Now, computationally elegant. The thing computes incredibly fast. Um, with, with, with other distributions, you have to do some kind of nonlinear optimization. This thing just involves a quick matrix inversion. It's like a, like a least squares fit. So it's extremely fast. And so what you're looking at here is three metal logs that drive each other. They are daisy chained together. And we've got the weight, the length, and the girth of the steel head. The red dots are the actual steel head data. And the blue dots are simulated steel head that fit the same cockamamie, nonlinear, whatever the heck it is. And, and now I just want to quick prove um, that that was not an overfitting in, that, in, the, in the fish weight. Um, how many people know what bootstrapping means? So bootstrapping is a wonderful, wonderful general technique that can be applied to anything practically. I'm doing some machine learning on something or other, and I grab a bunch of data. And it identifies something as the letter A. Fine. Now what I do is I had, say, 10,000 data points. Now I just throw all the data points in a bucket, pull out another set that's random and different, right, but from the same data set, see if it still identifies it as an A. Right. So in other words, it's, it's take whatever data you have. Don't use it all and randomly draw samples to see how robust your machine learning algorithm is or whatever it is you're doing. Oh, well, what's happening here is I'm randomly sampling the data. The yellow is the original. But every time I sample it, I get two modes. The bimodal distribution is not overfitting. If it can survive bootstrapping, right? I, I, I'm, this is like shaking the ladder with a shaking ladder on it or something. I don't know. But OK. Now, one other thing I want to I show you here. Um, the, the tools, ooh, didn't mean to do that. Oh, cancel that. Open the wrong Excel. I hope that doesn't shut me down. Please stop. OK. What's that? Five minutes, yeah. So I want to I take us back to Excel. And Now, again, uh, the format, we have an Excel format for the files, but XML, comma separate values, JSON, absolutely cross-platform. But, but I just want to show you the, the Excel tool here. Um, so I'm just going to simulate something like equals rand squared. And let me blow that up. So rand is like a spinner that goes between 0 and 1. And when I square it, I don't know what the heck you get, but I'm about to find out. So I go up here, and I say simulate, but this time we're going to run them internally. It pops the data table on here. And then I go here, and I say define that as an output. I'll just give it the name test. And then. I click that, and a 1,000 trials later, oh, there's that little sparkline graph. I could also click on that, and I could go over here and make a big one, a big graph like that. And, but it, because this has the range name of test, I can apply any Excel math to it. So let's look at the 90th percentile, 90%, and then equal percentile test, comma, 90. And there's a 90th percentile. Uh, so uh, the tools are available out here. Oh, models, if you want to look at models, we have, we have tons of models. Oh, that's, yeah, tons of models, uh, including the shell model down there. Um, 
one of the things, if you're interested in how this is applied, uh, you, you'll notice that our logo is probability management summing uncertainty. But of course, we do more than summing. But um, there is an article on applying this stuff at PG&E. And um, this was an ORMS today. And one of the first things we show in here is we explain the flaw of averages in terms of average dice. And I do have as a, as a takeaway here, average dice for everyone in the room. I think we may, may even have a couple for everyone. Uh, so the average dice are not much good for, for playing Monopoly, but, uh, but they don't take up much room. So here we go. Everyone can take a couple of these. And uh, if anyone is interested in what we're doing, right, data science folks, here, I'll take a few over here. Any data science folks who are interested in exploring the extraction of distributions from machine learning, take two of these, by the way, because you, I, if you flip two of them and count up the dots, there are three and a half dots, you will get seven, which is the correct average for two dice. And that, that kind of proves that, proves that averages are additive. Here you go. OK, so, oh, so now questions. I know I kind of, kind of blasted you with a fire hose here. And thank you for asking questions during the, uh, during the talk. Right, so, so exactly. So, so my dad uh, did not, how many people have heard of Bayesian statistics? Yeah, my dad didn't invent it, but he was the North American distributor for a while. <coughs> and so I grew up thinking that way. But uh, the other school is the frequentist that says, oh, you only have a probability if you're going to do something a thousand times. Frankly, a SIP would would make a frequentist turn over in their grave because it's not only, not only I roll the die, no, it's this particular roll. And I want to say something about that. In fact, this is really important, psychologically. Psychologically. People are uncomfortable with uncertainty. And I used to refer to SIPs as unambiguous uncertainty. No, it's this particular 10,000 rolls, right? Well, then I found out recently that people feel better about that. So they've done an experiment in which they show people a deck of cards, regular 52 cards. They shuffle them and they say, I want you to wager that the top card is red. It's got to be 50%. OK, experiment two. There's a deck that clearly does not have 52 cards. And I tell you, they're all red and black. There's at least one red and there's at least one black card in here. Wager that the top card is red. Does everybody see that has to be 50%? What would tip you one way or the other? OK, so what's the difference between those two experiments? Let me tell you. When I stick your head in a functional MRI machine, your amygdala lights up like a Christmas tree on the second question, because it's ambiguous. What does the amygdala mean? That's PTSD going on. Does that help you get to second base? No. That's where the people clam up and say, well, it's uncertain. It's uncertain, so it doesn't matter. I can't do anything about it. Yes, you can. You can stop earning $600,000 each time when you thought you were going to earn a million. That's what you can do. <laughs> you can make much better decisions. And, I, you know, so uh, I think I, I've also read a study somewhere that says that people who have practiced with simulation are more comfortable making decisions in the face of uncertainty. It's just like pilots training on a flight simulator. Right? When I first used to go gliding, I'd take people, yeah, question back there. I, 
I take people up with me. If they hadn't been on a flight simulator, they couldn't fly at all. If they'd been on the early Microsoft flight simulator, that old primitive thing, they could fly like champs. Yes, question. Say again? In PKE case, you have electrical demand that is uh, by customers. Yes. And you have the data completely. Uh, you have the seats. So for that seats, how long, uh, what's the time frame you typically expect the data? Uh, one year, two years? Oh, you see. Yeah. Did you see you're asking, well, yeah. well, I mean, you're asking me how to make beer. You're asking me about the distributions again. Yeah. I am just the messenger. But, it, you, but you have the data. You have the data, right? You have a real distribution without... Right. Data. But I mean, is it stationary? Is it auto-correlated? I mean, all these discussions, have, 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 there, been, have there been global changes in the economy? You, you can't just number crunch. I mean, the thing about machine learning is it can look at so many different things. It looks at the date, it looks at the temperature. Yeah, so that, that's my third question. So in that your seats, you have distribution. How that distribution you see through the year? Okay. For example, is that a house stable? Oh, is oh. This year, or the last year compared to the year before? Sure, okay. So I don't care whether it's stable or not. What I want you to do is go to the cloud and get the SIP from this afternoon. Because it's always being updated. The SIP you want to use is not one on my computer, but one on your corporate cloud yes. that the data scientists update every hour or every week or every year or however often they deem that it should be updated. It might not be stable, but then you better know that. Then your old uh, prediction or your estimate may not be stable. Listen, arithmetic itself does not work if the numbers are completely wrong. But with simulation, close counts. I don't need to know the exact distribution of the finish times of those web pages to know that I only have one chance in a thousand of finishing in six weeks. I don't have to know the exact distribution of the drunk in the highway to know that he's dead. I that, that well, no, 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 because there's a model to estimate how stable it is. Like you may be using an exponential smoothing model or, or an ARIMA model. Uh, these are models that, that, that look at changes over time and determine the stability of the data. Oh, I, I just have one other thing to show here. I'm, I'm taking, here's a, um, I'm taking you off to a website that, that Bridget's husband discovered that in real time gives you the distribution of future soybean and corn prices. And it does it using something called uh, a Black-Scholes analysis. And Lonnie, I don't even know if you've seen this. So I'm looking at corn, December 2019 corn, and I'm going to go to 2020 and I'm going to go to soybeans, and notice every time I do anything, I get a new distribution. And this is based off of the prices of commodity futures. Because if you're a farmer, you, don't, you want to lock in a price now. You, know, you don't want to find out, I, I'm going to sell it next December, and the price is, And so farmers are buying these, are selling these things all the time, the, these futures. Uh, Stochastic library unit with relationships preserved. So, for example, at Shell, this is, so this is a very important question. Very, sorry. Yeah, I'm already mic. Very important question. Distributions that are interrelated, right? So at Royal Dutch Shell, all the exploration projects depend on the price of oil. So you generate a SIF of the price of oil, then you send it to all the reservoir engineers. They run their own simulations, but all on the same sip of oil. So in trial one, every model has a $50 a barrel. Trial two, they're all at 40 a barrel. Got it? But it's a very good question. And that's where the word slurp comes from, stochastic library unit with relationships preserved. So thank God it was a problem, or there wouldn't have been any reason for the word slurp. Yeah.